I got to start the, the talk um, formally in, in, in a couple of minutes, but there are, there are a couple of, of other things that I want to just sort of get, get through before we actually start. So first of all, I need to try and get my first screen to go across. And for some reason, it doesn't always work first time, I've noticed um, when doing these. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to start again. Let's see if this will now do it. And yes, we're away. OK, so my talk tonight is uh, an introduction to deep sky imaging, uh, essentially for observers. Uh, I'm not going to get into any of the really advanced stuff here. Um, but if any of you have any queries at the end, please do feel very free to uh, to ask me and I'll do all that I can. Yeah, I was going to say, Steve, we mute everybody and we prefer to do questions at the end. Is that OK? That's absolutely fine right. with me. Yes, okay. I'm, I'm happy to do it either way. So that's that's absolutely great. OK, well, deep sky astrophotography really has to be one of the craziest ideas that any astronomer or photographer could ever have dreamed up. First of all, we're standing on a, a moving platform, so we have to pan to um, keep up with the images as they move, the objects as they move across the sky. The objects are so far away that we need long focal length lenses just to see them. The objects are so dim that we need wide open apertures and very long exposures just to connect the, um, enough of the, of the data um, so that we can actually see the objects in the first place. So from a photography point of view, it's absolute madness, but welcome to my world. Now, with all the, the problems that I've just outlined, um, it's really not unusual to hear an astrophotographer swear. And in fact, during the course of this evening, I shall be using the F word on several occasions. In fact, I should be using several F words. These six F words essentially um, are the main ingredients of a satisfactory um, astrophotography session. And if you can meet the needs of each of these F words, then you'll be well on your way to producing um, good or at least reasonable astro images. So I'm going to go through each of these F words in, in time. But before I do that, I know nothing about the members who are, who are on there. The only member I know is, is Mark, who is, I know is very knowledgeable. But I always think it's useful just to give people an insight into what a, a sort of images I'm interested in. Um, so what do we actually mean by deep sky objects? Well, as Mark actually mentioned earlier on, I'm very much into electronic music. And I've produced a little video for you. And that, uh, the, because of my interest in electronic music, I thought it, it would be quite um, appropriate in many ways to um, have some sort of spacey type um, music as the as the backdrop for the for the video itself. Uh, but then I thought, well, I don't know, maybe that's just a little bit too cheesy um, and and a little bit too obvious, really. So instead, what I thought I'd do um, is I'd actually set this little video to the glorious sound of the great Highland bagpipes, played by me. Perhaps um, Mark or Chris, you could just um, unmute for a second, just confirm that you're, uh, you're actually getting the audio. of yep. things. Yeah, it's fine. Excellent. And I thought that was pretty damn good, but I'm no expert on bagpipes. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, it wasn't good, but boy, was did it take me a long time to learn to even get that far. <laughs> okay, thank you very much indeed. Before I get on to the F words themselves, I think it's very important to talk about what I consider to be the most important aspect of an astrophotography setup, and that's how it's mounted. You might assume that the, the obvious thing is, is to have a really good telescope or a really good camera, but in fact, that's really, really not the case. The mounting is far more important. 
no matter how good your camera or telescope, if it's on a, a dodgy mount that doesn't track very well or is slightly wobbly or is affected by the wind and so on, you're on a loser before you start. So the mounting is incredibly important. And of course, the reason for this is that um, the, the stars appear to rotate above our heads. Of course, it's the Earth itself rotating, um, but we see it as the stars rotating above our head and we need to be able to follow them and track them. And this is just a little um, star trail image, just to give an indication of um, you know, the, the amount of movement that, that you can get over, a, over an imaging session. You can see that each one of these lovely little coloured um, part arcs um, are individual stars. Um, and this shows two things. First of all, their movement. And of course, if these stars are moving, um, then you can see that any object that you're trying to photograph will also be imaging, uh, uh, be moving rather. And if you're um, not tracking it accurately, then your image will blur just as these stars have blurred. But something else that it tells us, which I always find is quite interesting, is it enhances the colour of the individual stars when you take a star trail like this, so they can be quite useful. The other thing I always like to point out to, um, to people who, uh, especially if they're new to this, is we tend to think of Polaris as being um, the object to aim for when you're polaring on the polar aligning, but of course it's only a rough guide and in fact this bright blob here, this is Polaris, but you can see the actual circle of rotation, the uh, North Celestial Pole, actually isn't at Polaris, it's offset from it. But this is why it's so important to have the right kind of mount, because you need to be able to track these objects as they move across the sky. Now. A telescope like this, this is a Dobsonian that I, I, I built myself um, using a, a commercial telescope, but I built my own mounting for it. This is a wonderful instrument for doing ordinary observing, but unfortunately for deep sky imaging, it's absolutely useless. It's manual, you can't track with it. Um, it's really a, of no use for deep sky imaging at all. Now you might think something much more sophisticated like this, a proper go-to mount, um, this is a Celestron, and uh, I hate to say it, but there's a shop in, um, in Worthing near me that would very happily sell you one of these in the sure and certain knowledge that you were doing astrophotography, uh, but they would have no qualms about telling you that this would be the perfect telescope for deep sky astrophotography. But unfortunately it's not. And the reason that it's not is that this is an altazimuth mount, which means that it moves in discrete horizontal and vertical steps. Now, if you were an observer, if uh, looking at an object, you would see it tracking extremely accurately and you'd be able to observe that object for quite a long time and you'd be very happy with the results. But if you were to image it, you'd be very much less than happy with the results. And the reason for that is that if you're moving in discrete um, left, right and up, down movements, you can see that if you consider this, these little red boxes as being the frame of a camera, over time you can see that the frame has moved to the right and up, to the right and up, to the right and up, etc, etc, until it gets to the, um, the zenith when it then starts moving to the right and down and so on. But the objects themselves are following that blue arc, that's the arc that they, they, um, they follow as they traverse across the sky. And you can see that the objects themselves, these are stylized um, two stars and a um, an edge on galaxy, and you can see that these have quite clearly rotated within the field of view. And of course, if they're rotating, then you know that the individual images will be blurred over the relatively long focal, um, focal not focal length, sorry, um, exposures that are required to actually capture the light from them. So an altazimuth mount, no matter how sophisticated and accurately it may track from an observer's point of view, for deep sky imaging, unfortunately, it's really not suitable. What you really need is an equatorial mount. Now, this is a typical equatorial mount, um, and you'll see that it has a, an altazimuth um, component to it, but that is, it's been tilted, and it's been tilted so that if you were to draw a line through here, it would arrive at the North Celestial Pole, so that when this axis rotates, you can see that the telescope will rotate around the North Celestial Pole and provided that the mount has been set up correctly, um, it should be able to track it fairly accurately. 
So an, an equatorial mount is absolutely vital for deep sky astrophotography. And here you can see the same, same setup as before. We've got our camera uh, represented by the, um, the, the red frame. But you can see that now, as the whole system rotates in an arc, the stylized um, galaxy remains on track and it follows the natural arc throughout the whole of the image. So in fact, there is no field rotation and therefore your images won't be blurred. So that's the importance of an equatorial mount in astrophotography. Of course, you don't have to have anything as sophisticated as the EQ6 that I, I showed you just now. This is a very simple portable equatorial mount, if you like. In fact, it only moves um, in, in one um, orientation. It only moves in, um, in right ascension. And this is a typical uh, sort of scenario for taking very wide field images of things like the, the Milky Way. But it will track very accurately. Um, and you'll see that I've just got a standard camera with a fairly wide angle lens on it. Ideal for Milky Way type shots, very wide field shots, but uh, obviously not quite so suitable if you actually want to zoom in on an individual object. So let's get on with these, uh, these F words that I alluded to earlier on. The very first one is find. Now you, you might think it's self-evident that you've got to find the object in the first place, but those of you who are used to using an equatorial mount for finding objects will very um, readily agree, I, I, I suspect, that if, especially if you're using it manually at first, it's not exactly intuitive in the way that it moves, in that it, you can't just point it anywhere you want it to, um, like you can with a, an altazimuth mount. Um, but it's not, that's not the, the main issue. The main issue is that these objects are so dim that you can't just view through the camera eyepiece and say, oh yes, I can see that I've, uh, I've got the object correctly aligned um, and ready to photograph. They're so dim that you really need to take a reasonable length photograph just to see the object in the first place. Um, luckily, there are some tools that will help us do this. And of course, the first tool is that if your equatorial mount is accurately set up and polar aligned, and you've gone through the standard alignment process, the computerized hand controller that comes with the, with the mount should be able to get you pretty much on target. Um, so that you might just have to make some very, very tiny um, adjustments after you've taken some shorter um, image, images just to make sure you have indeed got the object in your field of view. I've actually taken my control a little bit further now. I no longer use a hand controller at all because I already have to have a computer outside with me for various aspects of the astrophotography capture process. Um, I now use my computer, if you like, as my hand controller, and I use a virtual hand controller. This is the one that I use here. Um, and so I can choose my objects directly from a planetarium program. This is Carte du Ciel. I choose the object that I want. I can right click on it. I can tell the telescope to slew to it. I can then take short exposure, make sure that I'm happy that I've actually got the object that I want in the field of view and, and so on. You don't have to go to this level of sophistication, um, but it certainly makes things a lot easier than just using the hand controller. Now to give you an idea of how I might do this, let's say that I wanted to image M57, which is a relatively um, planetary nebula. But very nearby is this lovely bright star Vega. Now some of my pronunciations, by the way, on these, on these star names may not be the correct ones. And the reason for that is that um, astrophotography is a, um, it's a solo um, endeavor. You tend to do it on your own. And so I've actually done very little uh, um, astronomy with other people. It's really only at the occasional star party, say once a year, um, that I actually meet up with uh, other astronomers. And, and you, know, you, you talk about stars and you realize that you've been pronouncing these things incorrectly. So if any of my pronunciations are incorrect, please accept my apologies. But the advantage of me, first of all, looking at this bright star Vega is that because it's bright, I only need to take a very short test image to see if I've got it in the field of view. 
And if I have got it in the, in the field of view, um, then I know that with a very, very short hop, I can then move to the main event, the object I want to image, which in this case, we're going to pretend is M57. Vega also has a, another purpose that I'll come on to in a second. Focus. Now you think, might think, well, focus, surely that can be done automatically. Well, yes, it can, but it's actually not as straightforward as you might think. Whereas we're used to a digital SLR camera being used terrestrially, it will do autofocus for you very accurately on long distance objects, mid distance objects, even real close up objects. Um, and the focus will happen automatically. This isn't automatically, of course, translated when you attach your camera to a telescope. So focus can actually be more problematical than you might imagine. But while we're, we've got Vega in the center of our field of view, we can continue taking a whole series of short exposures. I normally use probably a six second exposure and make small adjustments to the focus until Vega becomes as small as possible. That being the best indication that I'm actually in focus. Now, again, there are some tools that we can bring to the, uh, the party that will help us on, in this endeavor as well. But this is our second F word. One of the tools that we can use is if you have a telescope that has a, a spy evade on the front of it, something like a, um, a Ricci creation or a, um, a Newtonian reflector, then you have these rather obvious veins across the front. Now these produce diffraction spikes. Um, some people find them very attractive, some people don't. I actually, I don't mind them. Um, I think I prefer my stars without them, but, 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 but I, I'm not precious about using a, um, a reflector for, for this purpose. And so if my stars do end up with, a, with a, a cross of light on them, I really don't worry about it. But we can actually use these to our advantage at the focusing stage. So imagine that we're still, we've still got Vega in the, uh, in the center of our field of view so that we know that we're correctly aligned. Um, we can do a, um, various things. We can um, recalibrate our, our telescope so that we know that any movement that we do now will, in a, a sh at least if it's in a short distance, will still be very accurate. We can even do some sophisticated stuff called plate solving, whereby you take an image and your computer will then analyze all the stars in that image and decide exactly where you are. Once you, the um, software knows where you are, it can tell the mount um, to apply an offset um, so that you have a very, very accurate positioning system. But for now, let's just have a look at the, uh, the focusing aspect of it. Now here's a typical image using a Newtonian reflector aimed at Vega, and you'll see that we've got these diffraction spikes, which we'd expect, but you'll, um, hopefully you'll see that we've actually got double spikes here. And this is a pretty good indication that we're out of focus, because of course we should just have two, uh, well, a cross with a, a nice crisp outline to it. But we haven't got that. The other telltale is to look at these stars. These aren't pinpoints, the point stars. These are quite clearly out of focus. These stars, in inverted commas here that look as though they're in focus. In fact, those are hot pixels. A hot pixel is when your camera gets um, starts warming up and it produces um, a odd artifact, uh, artifacts caused by the warming of the sensor. They're called hot pixels. And you mustn't confuse those with the, with the camera itself being in focus. If we move on now, having continued our series of six second exposures and adjusting our focus, you can see that we can now use um, the spider vane on the front of the telescope to give us a nice sharp cross. Once we have a nice sharp cross, we know we're accurately in focus. And of course, these stars are also accurately indicating uh, that we've got a much sharper focus because they're much smaller, they're much brighter, and so on. So that's one little tool that you can use for focusing. However, in recent years, a guy called Pavel uh, Bartinov produced um, a little object that you, you put on the front of your telescope, which gives you a really enhanced set of diffraction spikes. So they're similar to the spikes that you get from an ordinary Newtonian reflector, but you'll notice that these cutouts are at angles to one another. And they produce a very, very specific and very useful um, 
artifact, if you like, um, made out of diffraction spikes, which is a cross with a line running through it. Now, if you continue um, taking these six second exposures that I was talking about um, and make small adjustments to your focus, you'll find that the line and the cross will move in relation to one another. And when the line very accurately bisects the cross, you will know that you actually have perfect focus, not just perceived, but essentially perfect focus. To give you an idea of, of how this changes um, as you make the adjustments, this is with the focus wrapped a little bit too far out. This is with the focus wrapped a little bit too far in. And this is with it almost right. Oh, sorry, I've gone the wrong way. This is with it almost right. But if you look really, really carefully, I hope you can see that this little triangle here is a fraction narrower than this triangle here. So I still know that I'm a little bit out of focus. So I can still make the tiniest tweak changes to the focus until this line accurately bisects that cross. And when that's done, I have as near as darn it perfect focus. You have to remember to take that mask off though, after you finish your focus run. Um, obviously I've never ever, well, maybe a couple of times, left that mask on. Um, it's a common mistake. But there's a, a really accurate way of getting focus. And of course, once I've got my focus, um, I've removed my Barton off mask, I can now issue the final um, command um, for the telescope to move to um, M27, no, sorry, M57, uh, which it will then do. And I know that I have an extremely good chance that M57 is going to be very accurately in the middle of the field of view. I mentioned tools just now. I actually have a, an electronic focuser on mine. This isn't one that's operated manually with a hand controller. Um, this is a system that uses the computer um, and it plots what is known um, as, a, um, as a, a, a V fit, if you like. These are a whole set of images and it tracks as we get towards perfect focus. Um, you never quite see the star in perfect focus, which is why it's cut out into a little curve here rather than going straight down to the point. But by plotting this V curve um, on the computer, which happens all automatically, the computer can extrapolate where focus would have been in a perfect world, which of course is at this cross point here. So you can use the, the computer to do an autofocus, but it takes probably two minutes or so to do. But I find it invaluable um, I refocus every hour to allow for changes in the ambient temperature because that, of course, has an effect on the materials used in the telescope. Um, if it's, you know, they expand if it gets warmer, they contract if it gets colder and so on. So the focal length will change, which, of course, means the focus will change. So it's very important to keep on top of the focus during the, the, um, the length of an imaging session. And some of my, my sessions are, you know, eight hours or so. Um, so that there's all sorts of um, possibilities for it going out of focus. So I use an automated system, but of course it, you don't have to do it automatically. You could just go out there, say once an hour and do another manual focus. If you're using a wide angle lens, um, you might very much want to um, focus not with the object or uh, with the test image in the middle of your field of view, but with the image perhaps offset a little bit. And this is a just a, a little, little grid. It's sometimes used for um, actually composing images in, in terrestrial um, photography so that you, you, you get the, the, the best aspects of, of an image. You've got a feel for where they are. Um, but what I'm using it for here is this thirds point as it's called here. And the reason that I, if I'm taking a wide field image, let's say of, of the Milky Way, I would put my focus star not in the center, but somewhat offset because I'm using a wide angle lens here, which will have some distortion. And what that means is that although you might have the object in the middle perfectly in focus, out towards the edges, the stars will be out of focus, which looks horrible. So if you focus at a, a position like this at one of the thirds, 
you sort of get the best of both worlds. The center will be slightly soft. The very far outside will be slightly soft, but the grade in quality between the center and the edges will be very much smaller than it would be if you just had a really sharp set of stars in the center and really blurred ones at the outside. So just a little tip if, you, if you're doing um, wide field images of, uh, let's say, the Milky Way, rather than focus with an object in the center of the screen, have it set at one of these thirds. It really does make a, a big difference to the quality of the stars in the image. We've now um, completed our focus and we've now um, told the telescope to move to, um, to our, our main imaging object, which is um, M57. And we know that it's going to do it um, pretty accurately because it's only having to move a very small point from Vega to there. So now we've got our object, hopefully, in the very center of our field of view. And so we're ready to start imaging. Actually, we're not quite ready to start imaging. I'll explain why in a minute. Let me just take a quick test image with something like um, a planetary nebula. Uh, it's unless you're really close into it, um, it doesn't really um, matter exactly where it is in the field of view. You may as well do it in the in the center and get it properly um, imaged. And then if you once you've finished doing your processing, you can crop the image a little bit if you want to to move in, so you don't have such a huge expanse of sky around it. But for an object like a planetary um, nebula, um, th this is good enough. This is, this is accurate enough. Now, this is, as I was saying earlier, just a six second exposure. So the quality is not going to be great. I mean, I would expect to image this for at least 10 minutes. Certainly not less than that. Um, so a six second exposure will, will capture some, uh, a certain amount of data, but nowhere near the sort of quality that we're looking for but at least it confirms for me that I am in the right field of view. But supposing you're taking an object which is actually going to fill your screen and therefore you need to be much more um, careful about how it's framed. Well, this brings us on to the third of our F words, the framing. So let's say that we wanted to have a look at um, the Veil Nebula, for example. Uh, this is the witch's broom. This is Pickering's triangle in here. And I've used my planetarium software to put an overlay of the how the frame would appear um, using my telescope and my uh, the, the sensor of the size that I have. And you can see that to get those objects in there, I've got to be very, very accurate in how I, how I do it. So this tells me essentially how I've got to align using my planetarium software um, both the telescope and the camera to get all the, the items that I need in there. If I then take one of my test images, it looks pretty dire, doesn't it? But I'm hoping that you can see that up here, we've got the witch's broom, and here we've got Pickering's triangle starting to tail off here. Now, again, this isn't an astro image. This is just a, a very short exposure, just to make sure that I have got the image correctly framed. And from here, um, this tells me that in essence I have. I've hardly got any more space at the top, therefore I know that I'm not wasting area up here. I've got Pickering's triangle right towards the edge over here, and I've got the witch's broom right to the edge over there. So with the telescope and camera setup that I'm using for this image, I've got it framed as well as I can do to, to collect as much of the nebula as I possibly can. And of course, when I actually finish the image, do a little bit of cropping, this is what I end up with. Now this will have been something in the region of, I think this is about a 15 minute exposure. And as you see, it's collected a tremendous amount of detail in, in that time, which is broom quite clearly here with all sorts of other lovely little bits hanging on here. Pickering's triangle now actually looking like a triangle with these lovely wisps of uh, nebulosity floating off to here. But I wouldn't have been able to do that if I hadn't done the test images first, just to make sure I had it accurately framed. Because in a very short exposure, um, I wouldn't have seen very much. And certainly through the camera eyepiece, if I was using a digital SLR camera, I wouldn't have been able to see this at all. 
but we're still not quite ready to start the imaging run itself. We need to move on to the fourth of our F words, and that is to follow. I've already been discussing the, the fact that you need to use an equatorial mount, and you might think that's, that's it. Use an equatorial mount with a, a, a go-to system on it um, from a reputable maker, and it should track the object as it moves across the sky. Well, from an observer's point of view, it most certainly will. It'll work extremely well. But, it's quite a big but. This is the ring nebula that we were talking about earlier that I wanted to image. This is it here. And this is an image taken over um, 60 seconds, but with the drive motors turned off. Well, as you would expect, it's streaked off, exit down south, uh, an absolutely useless image. We've got these star trails um, and the object itself has trailed very beautifully, um, as you would expect. So, okay, you wouldn't take an image with the drive turned off, but this demonstrates what we're up against. However, this is with the drive turned on, on a mount that um, I've set up really carefully. I've got beautifully balanced. I really trust the mount. It has a good go-to system on it. There are no metal fragments um, in the grease. It's a good mount. But this is typical of a 300 second exposure, a five minute exposure of the ring nebula using that system, but without any guiding at all. Now, of course, it's a lot better. You can quite clearly see that this is the ring nebula. It's captured some, some color. It's captured a little bit of detail, reasonable amount of detail. It's quite clearly now that we're looking at a, a planetary nebula. But you've really got to look at the stars to see that they've moved quite considerably in that time, despite the fact that we've been tracking, we thought, accurately for five minutes. And of course, if the stars are blurred or streaked as they are here, we know this object is going to be blurred and streaked as well. So this is an image taken without guiding. Now this is uh, a close-up of one of my eyes. I'm, I'm actually an extremely attractive young guy close to, and this is further proof of that. One of the ways that you can do guiding is by having a second telescope mounted on your imaging telescope uh, with a crosshair eyepiece, and you simply look through the, eye, the um, guide scope. Um, you look at a, a fixed star, you adjust the reticule so that they're on that fixed star, and you then use your hand controllers to go left, right, up, down to track that star as it slowly moves away from the crosshair, which we know it's going to do as demonstrated in the, in the previous image. Um, and this is called manual guiding. Um, you have to do it for the whole length of the exposure. So if you're taking a 10 minute exposure, you've got to stand there for the whole of that 10 minutes, um, eyeing through the eyepiece, desperately trying to keep that um, guide star uh, on the center of the reticule. I've done this, I've served my apprenticeship with this, and I'm here to tell you it was one of the most uncomfortable and unpleasant experiences of my whole astronomy life. I certainly wouldn't want to do it again. It really was that painful. However, that's what they used to do before we had auto guiding systems. And bravo to those who did it, because it's not fun. But this is what you get when you start guiding. Here's another five minute exposure. And as you can see, we've now got a much better image. We've got far more detail in here. You can see the little wisps of additional nebulosity now. You can see the central star. Um, these stars are a much nicer shape. They're much more circular. I ought to say, by the way, that this is one of my earlier images. In fact, most of the images that you're going to see here uh, are images that I took years ago because I, I started talking about this, um, this subject uh, when I'd only been, been doing astrophotography for well, probably three or four years. So these are all earlier images, but I hope you can see you know, the big improvement by having um, the guiding in place. But instead of using the manual system, you can now move on to using an auto-guided system. Now here's uh, one of my older telescopes. This is an ED80. Sitting on top of it, I have an ST80. And sticking in the back here is my guide camera. Now a guide camera is just wonderful. It replaces the Mark I eyeball 
with a small camera whose only task is to take a series of photographs, perhaps every one, two, three seconds, something like that. Currently, I use three second exposures to feed that image to the guiding software on your computer. The guiding software has a look at it and says, has this star moved since the last image? If it has moved, the system automatically commands the mount to move very slightly, to move that guide star back where it was. And it does that every three seconds. So it takes a, an image, downloads the image, the software analyzes the image, has the star moved? If it has, it sends a correction to the mount, the mount then moves um, to allow for that change. So you then have, if you like, a closed loop in which your system automatically corrects itself for any deficiencies in the mount itself. And those deficiencies could be manufacturing def um, deficiencies, um, the fact that you're using cogs, the fact that you, your grease um, has to be, uh, can be compressed, uh, the changes in temperature and therefore the tightness of the mesh between your gears. There are a whole load of things that could go wrong. Even the wind blowing would be, would be enough to do it. Um, but an auto guiding system will automatically correct for that. And that's what I would really recommend anyone doing astrophotography should aim for. This is the, um, or rather that is actually one of the guide cameras that I use. It's a very, very simple camera. It's just a, a little sensor inside a tube connected with a USB cable directly to the computer. Um, it's as simple as that. And I use guide, guiding software, which is available free of charge. Um, and that will keep my telescope very, very accurately following um, the star that I've chosen. But of course, if I'm following that star very, very accurately, because these two telescopes are coupled to one another, then if the top telescope is accurately following the sky, then we know that the imaging telescope will also accurately be following the sky. Therefore, the object that it's imaging will remain perfectly in the position that you want it to at the start of the session. There are other ways of running an auto guider. This is the system that I currently use. This is my um, focal reducer field flatter. This goes into my uh, into the focus uh, on my refractor. I've got my imaging camera on the back. This is a one shot color. Um, sorry, this one isn't. No, this is my mono camera and it has a filter wheel on it so I can change the filters, which allows me to produce a color image, even though the camera itself is a black and white image. This is my guide camera, which originally went into the second telescope. But I've done away with the second telescope because I've got a clever little device in here called an off-axis guider. And an off-axis guider has a little prism about here, which picks off some of the light that doesn't fall on the main sensor. So you've got light from the stars surrounding the object you're imaging. Um, the majority of that light falls on the main sensor, but some of the um, light from the edges falls onto the prism here, and the prism diverts it through 45, so, um, 90 degrees straight into the guide camera here. And again, the guide camera passes those images onto the guide software. The guide software analyzes the image and makes corrections to the pointing of the mount. This is an ideal situation here because one of the problems with using two telescopes is because of their weight, they can actually move very, very slightly in relation to one another. And you get an effect known as differential fletcher because the mountings flex very, very slightly, but they flex differently from one another because of the different masses involved. Whereas a system like this, which has very, very little weight, there's very little propensity for there to be any movement between this plane and this plane. So it's a very, very accurate way of holding your guide camera. It's called an off-axis guider off-axis because it captures light that is off-axis to the main imaging camera. You can also buy standalone um, guiders. This is one that has a, both a camera component and a controller made by um, Skywatcher. Um, quite useful for people using just a, a standard digital SLR camera who don't want to have a computer out in the field with them. If they're going to a dark site, they just take um, their ordinary 
um, equatorial mount, um, the DSLR camera, an intervalometer for taking multiple images, um, a second telescope or possibly even an off-axis guider to clip this onto, and then all the guiding corrections are controlled by this little controller. I never really got on with, with these. I gave one a try. I had the fortune, as Mark mentioned earlier, of um, being able to review um, numerous bits of equipment for the Sky at Night magazine. This was one of the pieces that I, um, I reviewed. It worked very well, but I didn't like it anywhere near as much as using my computer. But lots of people don't want to take a computer out into the field, so this is an alternative. Now, I've got to use a little bit of license now um, so that I can keep the, the F words flowing. I'm going to talk next about the final part really of, of the imaging session itself and that's the filming itself. Now of course we don't use film these days although in fairness when I started I did start with a film camera but it was an absolute nightmare. I've explained already the difficulty with framing and focus and so on. You only find out that you've got the framing and the focus wrong when the film comes back from the processor maybe a fortnight later and if you didn't get it right the whole session all that money tied up in the film and the processing completely goes to waste. These days we're very fortunate digital cameras are relatively cheap, especially digital SLR cameras. Many of us already have a DSLR camera, um, so we don't even need to buy a camera. Um, there are some disadvantages to that, which I'll come on to in a second. But this is the fifth of our F words, film. Now there are essentially three kinds of camera that we can use for imaging. The digital SNR camera that I've already mentioned, um, CCD cameras, these are still my favourite cameras, charge couple device cameras. Um, these are, um, for me, the best of, uh, of the cameras that you can use for, for deep sky imaging. They have various advantages that I'll come on to in a second. But more recently, CMOS cameras, which use the same technology as a digital SNR camera, starting to reach the point where they're really catching up with, with the CCD camera at lower cost and with some advantages, but also some disadvantages as well. But CMOS and CCD cameras, those are the cameras of choice for deep sky imaging, but you don't have to go down that route. A standard digital SLR camera will take some really, really good images. Let's have a look at digital SLR imaging first of all. This was the first digital camera that I had. It's a, um, a Canon 300D. Um, I mean, it, it, you, you could probably pick one of these up on eBay now for 50 quid. Um, it's amazing what you'd be able to capture with this. The advantages of using a digital SLR camera is it's completely self-contained. It has its own power supply. It's got a viewfinder. It has a, a large sensor, which means that you can take high resolution images. You can certainly take long exposures. I mean, you could easily take five, 10 minute exposure of these using what is known as bulb mode. Um, because it has a removable lens, um, you can swap one of these lenses for the telescope. I mean, essentially a telescope just becomes one of your, your um, interchangeable lenses. It just happens to be a very big one, probably so big that it holds the camera rather than the camera holding the lens. And the cost is very reasonable for the amount of resolution and sensor size that you get. The disadvantage is that it has an infrared filter in it, which it needs for terrestrial use. Um, and that infrared filter is aimed at terrestrial use, uh, clearly. And unfortunately, it rather eats into a very important part of the red band that we're interested in as astrophotographers. And that's the, the portion where hydrogen alpha emissions are to be found. And hydrogen alpha emissions are very, very important in deep sky imaging. So the, infra the infrared filter can be a bit of a pain. Um, because the um, camera is going to be taking long exposures, the sensor will start to warm up. And as it warms up, it produces um, noise. Uh, that noise is known as thermal noise. And that will um, spoil quite a lot of the quality of your image. But in conclusion, it's a good all-rounder, and of course you can use it for other things. 
You can operate your digital SLR camera, as I mentioned earlier, by using a thing called an intervalometer. This is one that I picked up on eBay for, I think it was 19 pounds. This allows you to set the exposure length that you want, the number of exposures that you want it to take, the gap between each exposure that you want to leave, perhaps let the sensor cool down a little bit. You've, once that's set up, you run the run start button and you can then leave the camera taking no end of uh, exposures all by itself while you set up your second telescope and do some very enjoyable observing, um, perhaps at a, another object. The digital SLR camera, as I mentioned earlier, treats your telescope as just another interchangeable lens. In this case, this is it connected um, to my 10 inch uh, Newtonian. Uh, but you could also use it, of course, connected to a refractor. You'll notice I've got an extension tube on here. The reason for that is that normally um, when you use a, ref a refractor, you have a star diagonal which bends the light up so that you can look down into it with your eyepiece. And in so doing, um, you have a, an extended light path and the telescopes are designed with that in mind. But when you put a camera on there, you won't be able to achieve focus because there isn't sufficient outwards movement of the focuser. So it's normally necessary to put some kind of an extension tube between your digital SLR camera and indeed any other camera um, and your focus tube. So that's what that's there for. Now I mentioned the infrared filter and the significance of it. This is one of my very, very earliest images of the um, of M42, the Orion Nebula. And you'll see that although I've captured some you know, quite pleasing detail in here, um, the core itself is burnt out. That, that's, that's what happens you know, when you first start out in this. There are ways around it, uh, which I very briefly touch on a little bit later on. But you can see I've collected a reasonable amount of detail. It's quite clearly um, M42. But notice how the colors have been skewed towards blue. Um, I actually quite like the colors, but they're not particularly natural. If, you're, if our eyes were sensitive enough, we would see the, um, the nebula it, it, with much more of a deep red to it, something a little bit more like this. And these are typical of the colors that you get when you're using an Astro CCD camera, which doesn't have that rather savage infrared filter in it. And just to give an indication of why we have this problem, if this is a plot of um, the most important aspects of, or rather the most important region, if you like, of um, the hydrogen alpha portion that we're interested in, you'll see that this Canon filter, this is its profile, this is how it cuts off the light. And you can see that it actually chops off the hydrogen alpha so that only about 22% of the available hydrogen alpha light actually passes through. The rest is filtered out by this filter. That's great for daytime use, but very bad news for nighttime use. However, if you remove the Canon filter and replace it with um, a Barda Astro Conversion filter, indicated by this blue, you'll see that we cut off the infrared, but we still retain the hydrogen alpha, and for that matter, the sulfur two emissions, two very important um, emissions in deep sky astrophotography, in particular when you're doing um, when you're doing uh, narrowband imaging, but hydrogen alpha also plays a very important part in developing the redness of the objects that you're imaging. So that's the the big disadvantage of using a digital a digital SLR camera that hasn't been modified. Just to give you an idea what uh, the difference is between a daytime image taken be both before and after modification. This is my garden, this is my, um, my old observatory. Um, this was taken with a digital SLR camera before it was modified, and you'll see that the colours are all accurate. This is indeed what it looked like on that rainy day. If we now compare that after the modification and with a Barda replacement filter in place, you'll see that the image is much redder. Now, that, of course, skews the colour for daytime use, but for astrophotography use at night time, this is exactly the sort of situation that we want. So you can have your camera um, modified 
GPSLR camera modified so that uh, you can use it for even better imaging. Uh, you don't have to, but there are, uh, I hope you can see, some great advantages to doing so. That, of course, makes it somewhat compromised for daytime use. But in fact, there are various tricks that you can do to, uh, to allow for that. You can, for example, put an additional infrared filter uh, in the light path between your um, camera and your lens to correct for it. And of course, you can play about with the white balance as well and various other little tricks that you can do. So you can still use the camera for, for daytime use. But in all honesty, once you've modified it, it really is then an astro camera um, and anything else is then a compromise for daytime use. But here is a again one of the, my very early images. This is the Rosette Nebula. This was taken with a modified digital SLR camera and you can see that the colours are much more natural, much more what you would expect to see um, in an object that's emitting um, hydrogen alpha. Ah oh, yes, the, the dog cluster. One of the problems with um, astronomy and astrophotography in particular is that the cost starts to mount up. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an expensive old hobby. However, I'm quite lucky because uh, my wife is very understanding in, in this and uh, she has to be because her hobby is her Labradors and they're not cheap. But one of the advantages of uh, having a digital SLR camera as your main imaging camera is that it's much easier to get it under the, under, the, under the radar of your other half, your husband or your wife. So that's a, a final advantage to the digital SLR camera. Easier to get under the, under the radar without too many questions being asked because it can be a, a dual use device. Which one is the dog star, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere near Sirius, I believe. So, um, uh, and for what it's worth, this is actually uh, uh, this is this is actually my wife's. She doesn't own all these dogs. The most we ever have at one time is two. But this is this is one of our dogs. My wife is very much into uh, into dog training. Um, if we now move on to look at the Astro CCD camera, and these are um, the, the comments I, I'm going to make essentially apply to CMOS as well. This is a a, a totally different beast, it looks completely different. There's no eyepiece, there's no shutter button, there are no adjustments for aperture. Um, it's got no memory. Actually, slight lie there, this particular one does have some memory, but, but it's only buffer memory. It's not memory that actually stores the images itself. Um, there's no way of focusing it um, easily. You can't see what you're looking at because there's no viewfinder and so on. However, they have all sorts of advantages. First of all, the sen sensitivity of, of the sensor is much more than uh, you would get with a digital SLR camera. You get a reasonable size sensor without spending stupid money, but the money does become very, very important. I mean, it, it would easily cost, mm, let's say four times as much to buy a CCD camera, so actually five times as much to buy a CCD camera, four times as much to buy a CMOS um, astro camera um, with the same size sensor as a digital SLR camera. So cost becomes a very, very big um, aspect of this. However, for, if you're really into your deep sky astrophotography, you just have to save up as I did. Uh, it took me several years to get there, but it, it was worth it. Long exposures, it was designed for them. It was designed to take hour long exposures if you want to. There's no infrared filter. Um, although in fact, it's quite common to put an infrared filter in the imaging train so that your stars don't suffer from splatter, which they might do otherwise. But it's an infrared filter designed very, very specifically not to encroach into the infrared area. I mentioned the, the noise, the thermal noise that's generated by a digital SLR camera. These cameras have got what is known as a Peltier cooling system in them, which is basically a small electronic refrigerator built onto the back of the sensor. This keeps the, the sensor nice and cool. I routinely run my sensor at minus 20 degrees centigrade, but I can actually run it at minus 50 degrees centigrade if I wanted to. 
I don't see the need. I'm happy with the noise reduction that I get using just minus 20 degrees centigrade. But it makes a huge difference to the amount of noise that is generated by the system. The disadvantages, apart from the cost, um, are that it uh, requires a PC to run it because it has no con hand controls on it at all. It has to be entirely controlled in software via a PC. But in conclusion, these sort of cameras are absolutely excellent for deep sky object imaging. They were born for it. There are two kinds of CMOS stroke CCD camera, a one-shot color or a mono plus filter. A one-shot color simply means that you get all the color data in one shot. And in fact, a digital SLR camera is a one-shot camera. You click the shutter, it takes a, an image, and it actually captures a color image for you in one pass. The other way of doing it is to have a mono camera and a set of filters. So you, you take a whole set of um, images using your red filter, a whole set taking your green filter, a whole set taken using your blue filter. In processing, you then combine them together to produce a red, green, blue image, also known as an RGB image. One shot color camera does that for you automatically. So this is a, a very brief um, indication of how you get to your final image. You have a whole set of red data, whole set of green data, whole set of blue data. You can see that the data are actually different from one, one another. Uh, in this particular object, the green and the blue don't look that different, but in fact, if you were to look at these much more closely, you know, a nice full-size uh, view, you'd see that they're very different. But you can see that here that the red is quite clearly a very different beast. But combine them together to produce an RGB image, and this is what you get. And this is a, an accurate rendition of what the object would look like, and these are reasonably accurate um, renditions of, of the star colours as well. I don't fuss too much over star colours. Um, I don't want them to look crazy. I don't want green stars, for example. But I, all my concentration is done on getting the, um, the actual main object correct. And in so doing, of course, the whole frame should then be pretty accurately um, coloured as well. So therefore the stars will show if they're essentially red, blue, uh, white, yellow, etc. The way that a digital SLR camera works, or indeed any one-shot colour camera, including a CCD or a CMOS, is that you have, if you think of these grey squares as being the individual pixels in your camera, sublimated on top of it are a whole range of filters. And these are just chemically produced. If you're, they're almost, well, I think you would say that they probably are printed on top of the actual sensor itself in a pattern. And you'll notice that there are twice as many greens as there are blues and reds. The original idea for that was that the human eye is more sensitive to green than it is to other colors. Uh, and therefore it made sense that if one of these was going to be um, shown more strongly than the others, it would be the green one. But one color did have to be different or rather it did have to be duplicated and it was the green that's done it. This is known as a matrix of filters. Uh, furthermore, uh, the most common one is known as a Bayer matrix. So the light that falls on this um, is filtered by these tiny filters, which are um, sublimated on top of each of the pixels. And the data, when it's then read out, um, takes this color information away with it because the, um, the camera itself knows what color filter is on top of each one of these individual pixels. The camera itself will then, of course, um, process to produce the, um, the image itself, or in the case of using uh, a one-shot color um, camera, um, these actual processing will be done in software on the computer. Now, just as I showed you uh, a digital SLR camera connected to um, telescope, this is a typical uh, one-shot colour camera um, connected to my Newtonian reflector. Um, there is the same camera, but this time connected to a camera lens uh, with a special adapter that I have here. 
So there are all sorts of possibilities if you're using um, astro cameras, you can use them with telescopes or with the right adapter, you can use them with a telephoto lens. This is actually a little bit of a, a killer combination because this is a 200 millimeter lens, it's a very high quality L series Canon lens. This is great for capturing um, some of the really larger um, deep sky images and again for capturing portions of the Milky Way. Now, if you're going to change filters because you're using a mono camera, you can do it completely manually. You can use a, a, a manual filter wheel, but it's so much nicer if you can automate the whole thing. And so you can have an automated filter wheel. Now this particular one takes, I think it's nine filters. Three. Yep, nine filters. Um, now you might think nine filters, well, we only need red, green and blue. Well, yes, that's sort of true, but we also take a, um, a fourth image called a luminance image. Now a luminance image is um, similar to taking uh, an image using a color, but using a mono camera with no filter in it. But in fact, you quite often use an infrared filter to make sure you don't get um, any star splatter. Um, and so there are actually normally four images taken to get an RGB image. And that it sort of image is called an LRGB image. You don't have to do it that way, but because so much light comes through using just a, a plain filter, you can use that to collect a huge amount of data so that you, if you like, you produce the backbone of the image using the luminance, and then you overlay, uh, if you like, an overcoat of color on top of it. So that the luminance produces the detail and the color is produced by that RGB overcoat that you put on it. So that's four of the filters used up. So why would you need the others? Well, I like doing narrowband imaging and the typical narrowband uh, filters that you would use would be hydrogen alpha, oxygen three, sulfur two, and hydrogen beta. Not everyone uses hydrogen beta, but I do. So suddenly that's eight of our, uh, our slots taken up before we even start. So you can very quickly eat into that, uh, that nine slot filter. Now these days, this is the camera that I use. This is a, a very sophisticated camera. This is the one that I can cool down to at minus 50 degrees if I want to. To do so, I have a little bolt on that goes on to these bolts here, um, which is basically a, a heat exchanger comp um, comprising uh, um, a little water bath, a sealed water bath. And through that, you pump cold water and the cold water takes additional heat produced um, in the extraction of the warmth from the sensor, and that allows me to get down to minus 50 degrees centigrade. To me, that's an awful lot of hassle. I don't bother using it, but the feature's there if I wanted to. What else is quite nice about this particular camera is that um, as well as having the cooling that you would expect, it has its filter wheel built in, hence it's such a peculiar shape. This is just where the sensor is here. This is where uh, you would connect it to your telescope. But even better than that, you'll notice that there's this little object on top of here. And this is the port for my off-axis guider. So behind here, there's a little prism. And this is, um, if you like, a built-in off-axis guider. So it's a very um, compact, clever little camera. So I've got the camera, I've got the filter wheel, I've got the off-axis guider, and a very, very efficient cooler, all built into one object. These are typical of the, of the filters that I use. I've mentioned these before, LRGB, luminance, red, green, and blue. They're for producing, if you like, accurate color images. Hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta, oxygen three, sulfur two. These are used uh, for producing false color images, but false color images with a big difference. And that's in the detail. Because these are no known as narrowband filters, you are zeroing in on a very narrow portion of the light band of the, um, the, of the, you know, the spectrum. And by being able to do that, um, you get just the data coming out on those particular very, very narrow um, portions of light. I actually use um, two different um, bandwidths. I use 
three nanometer, which is very, very narrow for my hydrogen alpha and oxygen three. Uh, but I ran out of money to buy one for my sulfur two because they're, they're very expensive, three nanometers. So I have a, a standard um, set made by Bada, uh, which are nominally eight nanometers in, uh, in, in band pass. Uh, but these allow me to take false color images, uh, which I can combine in various different ways, as I'll demonstrate in a second, uh, to produce um, a, a range of different kinds of color image. Over on the left here, by the way, I mentioned that uh, I, had this, I had a camera with a built-in uh, filter wheel. That's where the sensor is, and this is the, the filter wheel built in. This is the original filter wheel that I showed you earlier. So, one-shot colour camera, absolutely ideal for objects like um, star clusters. Um, absolutely perfect for that because we're not looking for hydrogen alpha emissions or anything like that. You don't need to have it modified to capture this sort of this sort of detail. Um, a digital SLR camera will take pictures of, of objects like this with, with great ease, make a good job of it as well. It'll also take um, excellent pictures of things like, uh, like galaxies. Again, although there is hydrogen alpha in galaxies, especially in the star forming regions, these little knots which you get around here, star forming regions, and you'll see that I've picked up a little bit of, of redness in there, but not the amount of redness that I would get if I was using a hydrogen alpha filter, for example, to enhance my color image. Uh, but this is typical of the sort of images that you could catch with um, the right telescope and a digital SLR camera. I've been talking about wavelengths. So I thought it might be quite useful just to put this into some kind of context. These are the, the wavelengths of, um, the, of the light that we're interested in capturing, the red, the green, and the blue. And these are the wavelengths of the um, standard RGB filters uh, that are used to produce the colour images. However, if we have a look at an overlay on this, we're now looking at um, typical narrowband filters, and you can see just how narrow a portion each of these takes. And if you have a look at the hydrogen alpha one here on the right, this little spiky bit here, you'll see it's taking uh, just a, a slither out of the very centre of the red. But that's quite useful because it's still red, it just happens to be very specifically the hydrogen alpha portion of the red that you're capturing. Whereas over here, you can see there's a, another very popular uh, filter choice, the sulfur two, but you'll see that this is also encompassed within the standard red filter. So you, you, you're not just getting pure hydrogen alpha de uh, detail, but you're getting sulfur two detail. Well, you can see that if you could segregate these two, you get two lots of really useful detail that you could then combine in various ways to produce a really detailed but color image. If we move over to the blue portion, you'll see that we're using a hydrogen beta filter. Okay, this isn't quite so conveniently in the blue section, but you can see that it is quite clearly going to be producing or rather collecting blue data. Well, we then have a little bit of an anomaly. The oxygen three data, is right on the cusp of change between the green and the blue. This has a great advantage. It's collecting both green and blue data at the same time. So is it blue? Is it green? Well, we can put this to really good use as I'll show you now. This is the same object. This is the um, is NGC 7000. This is what is known as the Mexico um, region. Uh, if you imagine the North American Nebula, which is its common name, imagine that this is the Mexico area here, this is the um, Gulf of Mexico, this is Florida over here, hence its name. Starting in the top right hand corner, this is a typical, again, admittedly an early one shot color uh, image. This could have been taken with a modified digital SLR camera or with a, a mono camera, uh, a mono one shot color camera. And as you see, we've got a reasonable amount of detail, quite accurate colouring. Um, it's a relatively pleasing image. But if we were to use narrowband filters instead, and use the HA for the red, if we now look at the bottom left image, HA for the red, O3 for the green, and hydrogen beta for the blue, you can see that we've got a rough facsimile 
of the colouring that's used in the one-shot colour camera, so it's relatively accurate. But look at the additional detail that it's picked up simply by using those three filters separately and, and collecting just that very narrow portion from each one. So you can see that you can produce a completely um, feasible, quite accurately coloured image, um, but with much more detail by using narrowband. If we then have a look at this one here, we're using the sulfur 2, hydrogen alpha and oxygen 3, but we're combining them in the same method that the Hubble Space Telescope uses, because the Hubble Space Telescope uses these three filters in, in narrowband. But we've done away now with trying to get any kind of accurate colour. What we're aiming for is the maximum contrast, the maximum um, differentiation between the areas that we've captured. And we do that by using the sulfur 2 as our red channel, the hydrogen alpha as our green channel, and the oxygen 3 as our blue channel. Now the colours that we get are completely unrealistic, completely false, hence I mentioned the, that they were false colours earlier on. But um, I actually quite like this, some people don't like this sort of colouring, but what it does give you is a huge increase in the amount of detail over this one. Okay, the colours might be all wrong, but look at the contrast, look at the, how much detail by combining the colours in a particular way that you get. Completely false, but great detail. And the last one I wanted to show you is a real anomaly. You may recall that I showed you that the hydrogen alpha was bang slap in the centre of the red, that the oxygen three was right on the cusp of change between the green and the blue. Well, some of the imaging that I really like to do is I use the hydrogen alpha as the red, and I use the oxygen three as both the green and the blue. That means I only have to capture two lots of data instead of three. And by combining them in this manner, using both the oxygen three for the green and the blue, when I produce my RGB image, I end up with a very nicely detailed image with a reasonable facsimile to what the, um, the image would look like if it was taken using a a, a true one-shot colour image, or an RGB image for that matter, but taken purely using narrowband filters to get the detail. This is what I like about narrowband, and this is why Mark said that, uh, that this was something I specialise in. Again, these are relatively old, old images, but they, they show the process quite well. This is a much more recent image. This was taken probably five years ago. Uh, and this is using purely hydrogen alpha and oxygen three combined in a different way. One of the joys of narrowband is it's up to you how you how you decide to actually combine the images. So although I'll be the very first to tell you that these um, these colors are completely unnatural, I hope you can see that there is a huge amount of gorgeous detail in here simply because I'm using narrowband. One of the disadvantages is that the stars, the colours of, of the stars, have been affected uh, adversely. A lot of them simply come out white. Um, the fact that they have come out a little bit blue in some of these does not mean to say that they are young stars. Um, they've simply taken on the hue that has been developed as I uh, did the processing, aimed purely at getting all the detail. But um, if you're prepared to put up with the, the fact that the images have completely false colours, this is the way to get really, really high detail images. This is um, M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. Um, you saw it earlier on in when I was demonstrating how a, a color image is made up. This is the, the main image, and this is what you see in the, in the majority of images of the Dumbbell Nebula. Certainly anything taken with a digital SLR camera, you'll see this, this shape here. The Dumbbell, by the way, is because of this shape. If you like, it looks a little bit like an apple core. And that's where it gets the dumbbell from. But because I've been using um, narrowband images and I've taken very long exposures, each of these exposures, by the way, was 30 minutes. And I took somewhere in the region of 20 of uh, hydrogen alpha and 20 of oxygen three to produce this image. 
Um, but because the, the sensor is very sensitive and because I'm narrowing in on a very, very uh, narrow part of the band, I've picked up a huge amount of this external detail that you just don't see in normal images. This is all genuine. None of this is, um, has been photoshopped in or anything. This is genuine halo detail, um, but brought out because of the, the fact that I'm using narrowband uh, filters to produce my image. This is the Veil Nebula. Uh, you may recall that I use this for my framing um, experiments. This is the Witch's Broom. Uh, this is Pickering's Triangle. Uh, this is the Eastern Veil over here. And just to show that you can combine these images in different ways, I've done this one to make it have a, an approximation to what would happen if you used a one-shot colour camera to capture the data. Here's exactly the same data processed in a totally different way. Um, now, you may not like the colouring of it, um, but the important thing is it shows the, um, the actual detail in, in a different way. And I think there's more detail in this image from exactly the same data than there is in this one. Courses for courses. I love narrowband, but it's not everyone's cup of tea. This is a very popular object. Um, IC1396, the Elephant's Trunk Nebula. This is actually only part of it. Um, but this for me is the most interesting part of the nebula itself. And uh, what I was really aiming for in this particular image was to get the separation between these two stars. And the majority of images that you see of these two stars here, actually I, I'm assuming my mouse is moving on your screen, I hope it is. Um, but uh, this is what I was really aiming for. Um, I beg your pardon? Is the, is the mouse showing? Yeah, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, but in so doing, I produced this, uh, this colour image, again, only using hydrogen alpha and oxygen three. Um, I really like the coloration this gives me because a lot of this stuff here is dust. And I rather like the fact that um, it's a dusty colour rather than just, you know, the, the, the red, um, and black that we tend to see. So again, for me, narrowband has worked really well on this object. It's brought out a huge amount of, uh, of detail. One of the offshoots of um, using narrowband imaging is that your stars are nowhere near as prominent as they would be for an ordinary image, uh, because again, you're only zeroing in on a very, very small portion of the, uh, of the light output. And that's why I was able to get such a nice separation between these two relatively bright stars. I'm also um, very keen on just black and white images. Uh, this is just the hydrogen alpha data itself. Um, and just as um, some portrait photographers really like black and white images rather than color, um, I think that hydrogen alpha stands out very, very nicely on itself, uh, not on its own, sorry. Um, so I don't always do color images. Uh, my wife normally says when she sees one of these, it'll be nice when it's finished. Um, but um, she's not an astronomer. We have to make allowances there. Um, of course, something else that you can do um, if you're going to um, um, play about with narrowband and um, ordinary RGB is have two telescopes, an image with both of them at the same time. I've tried this with a certain amount of success. Um, I no longer do it because although there was a certain amount of success, there were too many problems. I mentioned earlier with the guiding that you get differential flexure because these telescopes are able to move very slightly on their own. Um, so that's something that, uh, that can be a bit of a problem, but you can use two telescopes, two cameras at the same time, one of them catching color data. That would be this one over here. The other one capturing just the narrowband data. To give you an idea of, of how that works out, this is a, a typical one-shot color camera of um, the Butterfly Nebula. This is uh, Sadia in um, Cygnus, quite a bright star. Um, this is the nebulosity that I'm, I'm talking about, quite a distinctive shape. And here's the same object taken admittedly at a different focal length and with a different size camera, but this is uh, exactly the same object taken in hydrogen alpha. You can see there's a tremendous amount of additional detail Compare that with that. 
lots more detail in hydrogen alpha as you would expect. However, a little clever little trick, you combine the um, hydrogen alpha with the color data to produce a much more detailed color image. Um, so I'm using, if you like, my hydrogen alpha as the equivalent of my luminance channel. And this allows me to produce a highly detailed but color, colored image. And we're now reaching towards the end. This is the sixth of our F words, finish. And this is all about processing. The sort of processing we might want to do is calibrating our frames, producing color from the data, getting the best of our images and combining them together in a process called stacking, getting rid of the worst effects of light pollution, adjusting the brightness and contrast, adjusting the color saturation to make the colors a bit more uh, stand out more, adjusting the color balance. Um, if you've got some kind of gradient caused by light pollution or the presence of the moon um, or whatever. And perhaps if you do it very carefully and very gently, a little bit of sharpening to get the best of the data that you've collected. In terms of calibration frames, um, I'll rattle through these a little bit because it's not um, the most fascinating thing, but it's very, very important. We take three kinds of calibration frame, the first of which is a bias frame. And a bias frame is a frame taken with a telescope capped for the shortest possible, possible exposure that you can take. And what this captures is the, um, are, are the noise artifacts produced by the sensor when you download the data. There are no stars or nebula in here at all because we cap the thing. So all you're collecting is the noise produced in the download process. It captures all sorts of things. I don't know if you can see it, I hope you can. There's a little vertical line here. This is a line of pixels which aren't performing perfectly well. Very common in a, a CCD camera. Um, you would only see them on a, a, a night um, astrophotography um, or astrophotograph. Um, but if you were to subtract this bias frame from all of your other images, you would remove that noise component, including, believe it or not, that line of bad, bad pixels there. So a very important first calibration is to subtract a bias frame from each of your images. The second type is known as a dark frame. This is a frame taken, again, with the telescope capped but for the same length of time as the main images that you're taking. So if you were taking, say, five minute exposures of um, NG NGC 7000, you would also capture a whole load of dark frames for exactly five minutes as well. And if you were to subtract uh, these dark frames, which have all the noise only, because again, the telescope's capped, therefore there's no light falling on the sensor, you collect all the information regarding um, hot pixels, of which you can see that are numerous here, and also this noise streak produced by exactly that, that same set of pixels. If you subtract these, you remove the vast majority of the thermal noise that's still left, even if you were using um, a color, uh, sorry, even if you were using a refrigerator, a Peltier cooler on the back of your, your camera. So that's a very important um, second calibration. And the third kind of calibration is known as a flat frame. Now a flat frame is very unusual. For a flat frame what you're trying to capture is the cone of light that falls on your sensor. Just as the cone of light from the night sky falls on your sensor, you want to capture that um, but without any star detail on it. And you do that by, for example, putting an electroluminescent um, lamp over the front of your telescope and capturing images of that. Um, or you might get a, a white t-shirt stretch that over the front of your telescope, aim at a uh, diffuse light and capture the light from that. So you're collecting the light cone and all the contents of that, which will show you things like vignetting, where the light has fallen off towards the edges of the corner of the field of view, which happens on the, on the vast majority of, of telescopes, of course, depending on the sensor size. If you've got a very small sensor, you won't see it. If you've got a large sensor, you will start to see it. But it also picks up these horrible things. Even though I'm meticulously careful with my filters and my optics, and indeed the sensor on my camera, these are dust mites. And by the size of these dust mites, you can get an approximation of where they are. These big ones here are almost certainly on my filter. 
but these very small ones are tiny bits of dust which have fallen on the sensor surface itself. I'm going to call it subtracting. It's not actually subtracting. Mathematically, what you do with a flat is you divide it into your, your data. That's, that's complex. We don't really need to understand how, it, how it's done. Software does it for you. But if you can imagine that we subtract this noise image from each of your subframes, you get rid of the effects of the vignetting. So in fact, it will brighten the corners of your image automatically um, to compensate for the model that we produce here in our flat frame. I mentioned an electroluminescent panel. That's how I use it. Lots of people use the, the white t-shirt. This is the method I use because it's quick and simple. Just to give you an idea of the importance of a flat frame, these two images have been processed in exactly the same way, apart from the fact that this image was only calibrated with bias and dark frames. This is, sorry, the image on the left, not with flat frames. And you can see now that we've got vignetting around the edge. And we've got other artifacts across the image as well. Exactly the same data processed in exactly the same steps, but with the data having been um, processed um, and calibrated with the flat frame, produces this image where we have the same brightness all the way through and you can see more detail is now coming through. So flat frames are very very important. Once we've got our data calibrated we can then align each of the um, images together and then stack them to produce one single high quality image. So here's a, a set of images that I might have taken over a session, combine them all together, hey presto, a much more detailed image and that works by um, a simple process whereby the signal to noise ratio is increased dramatically because one of them is static, the other one is variable. And so in the stacking process, um, all the fixed data, which is the data that's coming from the, the stars um, and, the, and the, the object that you're, uh, you're imaging gets combined together, whereas the variable data gets thrown out, again, using software. We don't really need to know the complexities of it. The software does it for us automatically. Now, here's one of my very first images of the Andromeda Galaxy. This was taken with my digital SLR camera. Um, and you can see that although I live in a, um, an area of outstanding natural beauty, apparently, um, the South Downs, um, we have a tremendous amount of light pollution. This is from um, a combination of Brighton and Worthing doing their very worst to ruin my images. And you can see that um, I get this horrible muddy background to my one-shot colour images. But with some very careful processing, I can remove that uh, light pollution. Uh, here I'm showing you a section where I've only done the right-hand side. And then the final image somewhat cropped. Again, these are very early images of mine. Um, so please forgive me for that. But you can see that I've got rid of the light pollution to produce a much more pleasant image. So that's another typical thing that you would do in, in, in finishing. I mentioned earlier the um, M42, the Orion Nebula, and how you burn out the core. Well, one way of getting rid of that burnout is by taking a series of images of different exposures. So here's one taken with a reasonably long exposure, and you'll see that I've captured this outer detail here, this outer nebulosity, but I've burnt out the core. But I'm not too worried about that because in my next image, oh sorry, there it is processed. In my next image, um, I've taken a shorter exposure, which means I've got less of my um, outer stuff here, but this is starting to show through a little bit better now. It's still burnt out in here, but this detail is now showing. And then take another image at even shorter exposures, so I get even less burnout. I've now lost all the outer nebulosity, but you can see that I've now captured some of the, more of the detail on the inside. And you can keep on going down so that even this bit here would have gone. I can now combine all those images together in Photoshop. So I've got the outer um, image with the burnt out core. I can then overlay uh, the image that's got um, a little bit more of the core there, but not so much of the outside. And then my final image with just the trapezium area in there. Put it all together, 
We're now looking at the whole of the image. And you'll see that I've now got all the outer detail in here, all the dust lanes here. I always feel this dust is falling off here. I expect it to be in a big pile at the bottom of here. Um, the, the image itself was wide enough for me to capture the Running Man Nebula as well. But not only have I got all the, the detail here, but I've also captured a lot of the detail in the trapezium because I've been able to combine three lots of data together. So that's another typical thing that you would do in finishing. So lots of other things that, that we could do. If you'd like to see more of um, the images that I capture, um, I have a, a website. These are the website addresses for it. Um, as um, was mentioned earlier on, I've uh, written two books, Making Every Photon Count, which is a beginner's guide to deep sky astrophotography, and goes into much more detail of the sort of things I've been discussing tonight. Uh, but my second book, Dark Art or Magic Bullet, um, is essentially aimed at Photoshop users, although other um, pieces of software do have to be used. And it follows on, if you like, from where I got to tonight with just briefly talking about the very early parts of um, image processing. And that concludes my talk for tonight. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. If you've got any questions, I'd be very pleased to uh, answer them if I can. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. That was absolutely wonderful. I, I, because I've been very fortunate to actually be by the side of you whilst you've been doing some of this work. Um, and it's really lovely seeing how you create some of your images. Anyway, so the floor is open, I suppose, for lots of questions from Astro Images amongst us. Over to you, folks. Yeah, especially the Astro Images amongst us. Come on, guys. We do have some, Steve, honest. Oh, it's right. Doesn't matter if you haven't. Uh, putting aside um, uh, narrowband filtering, do you get less uh, resolution or, or between the two options of um, the one-shot colour or mono combining uh, multiple um, images with different filters? I would have thought with the uh, one-shot colour, you're not collecting as many photons per... The, the sort of the, the small filters that you showed in the um, in the, in the diagram, there seem to be less. Yeah, that's a, it's a very very good question, and your um, your um, answer to it, your own answer is in fact completely correct. One of the um, the byproducts, or rather, I say it's a byproduct, it, it is part of the process. Um, I mentioned the matrix called is called the the Bayer matrix, and that matrix has to be decoded either in the camera or on the computer itself. And the process by which that happens um, has a side effect uh, whereby um, some of the, um, the data has to be interpolated. Um, interpolation simply means it has to take a best guess. It knows that, um, I don't know, the first pixel in the left row um, is red and the, um, the first pixel in the third row um, is blue what's the pixel in the middle? <laughs> so there's a certain amount of interpolation that goes on, and that interpolation, if you like, smears um, the, 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 yeah, the, the resolution, essentially. Yeah. So yes, you're, 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 you're absolutely right. Um, you do lose resolution. In terms of the number of pixels that your image um, produces, the resolution itself is, is, is the same, of course, yeah. um, if you did a, did a pixel count. But it's the interpolation um, that is part of the de debaying process that will actually lose you some of the detail. So, if you wanted the very best uh, one, uh, rather, sorry, the very best RGB images that you could get, you would use a mono camera and LRGB filters. Definitely the RGB, but um, the LRGB allows you to capture more of the most important detail. Um, imaging in a shorter period of time. Hence, LRGB is a, a very common way of, of imaging these days. Brilliant. Thanks. Does that answer your question? It does indeed. <laughs> Steve, just a couple of questions, if I may. Oh, is there a minimum spec of DSLR camera, or is it just an off-the-shelf DSLR camera you could start with? And secondly, you mentioned about the infrared being removed from a DSLR camera. Is yes. that a physical thing or is that something you could turn off in the software? Right, two very, very good questions. The, um, 
the camera itself um, is is generally just an off the off the shelf camera. It doesn't it doesn't have to be a top of the range one. I mean, for example, if we look at the at the Canon range, um, the cheaper ones are things like four fifty D, six hundred D, seven hundred D, thousand D, twelve hundred D. The more professional ones are tend to be things like six D, four D, eighty D, etc. They're completely wasted. We're not using any of their features. All you really want is a way of making the sensor capture the data. And therefore, um, all the frills and, and, and advantages of the more advanced ones are completely wasted. So it's the cheaper um, DSLR cameras that are the ones to go for. Um, Canon are probably the better choice. Uh, lots of people use Nikon and use Sony, and there's no reason why not, but Canon has, um, has been, become the de facto standard in a way uh, and it becomes sort of self-cycling in that people who are writing software to, um, both for processing and for image capture tend to aim at Canon first of all and so coming in at this stage there's more available software there's more knowledge out there um, more video um, information about it more um, more books written about people using Canon cameras themselves but there's no reason why you shouldn't use any of the uh, any of the others. Um, with regard to the infrared filter, we are talking about physically taking the camera apart and removing the filter. Um, I made it look as though I had done it myself. In truth, I didn't dare do it myself. I know lots of people who have done so. I know several who have ended up with doorsteps, the doorstops, by doing so. Um, personally, I would pay someone to do it or even better, um, buy a second-hand one because they don't hold their value very well. Mm. Um, and the chances are, unless it's been bashed around, it will work absolutely fine for, for our purpose. Um, but no, it is physically a case of removing one filter and either replacing it with a Bada ACF filter where the old one was, yeah. or dispensing with that and putting a different kind of um, astro infrared filter somewhere else in the light path. Thank you. That's okay, my pleasure. Do you have to actually replace uh, the infrared filter with another piece of glass? Or no, you can don't. You just remove it. No, you, you can literally just remove it, and that's what the majority of people do who are, are doing their own modification. Um, what that will do is affect the focus, but that doesn't matter because you have to focus manually anyway. Um, and if you were using a, a, um, a focuser like the electronic focuser that I use with the, that, that motor drive on the on the thing, th that doesn't care whether you've got a filter in there or, there or not. It's only looking at the data. And if it decides the data is in focus, whether there's a filter in there or not doesn't really matter. Um, so th th there's a, a reasonable argument for just completely removing the filter altogether um, and then putting an infrared filter aimed specifically at astro use um, somewhere else in the in the light path. But it's, uh, yeah, you, 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 you would generally just remove that filter altogether. Yes, because at the moment I'm used I'm looking at, I've got a 450D. Oh, yes. Uh, but actually having the filter removed is something like £250. Yes. When the actual camera itself is worth about 80 Yes. So it's quite a, an increase to say the least. It is, yes, it, 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 absolutely. Uh, I mean, if you're, if you're, um, if you're very good at DIY, very, very careful. There's no reason why you shouldn't do it yourself. There are all sorts of videos to show you um, how to do it. But the biggest problem is, although there are no springs that are going to bounce out at you, um, the inside of the camera, um, it has multiple printed circuit boards on it, and they're each held together with very, very thin ribbon cables. And it's reinserting those ribbon cables into their holders that causes the most um, propensity for damage. And if you don't get them right and you fire it up and it doesn't work, you could be taking it apart numerous times and still not getting it to work, which is why, to some extent, I'd be quite tempted to buy a second-hand one. Um, they're, they're, they're always available. As a matter of interest, I don't say that lightly. I, I don't tend to buy stuff second-hand, um, not because I'm wealthy, it's just that I know that if I buy it brand new, um, it's worth saving up for, and I will keep it in absolutely pristine condition, 
Whereas um, from what I've seen of, of equipment that, that lots of people have bought, um, especially telescopes and mounts, they have rusty weights on them and rusty um, counterbalance bars and uh, you know, gaffer tape holding the hand controllers together. All, all of those things, I, 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 I just, it doesn't sit well with me. But with something like the camera itself, provided you don't spend silly money on it, and it would be typical for you to buy a modified 450D for probably 125 pounds. It's all been done for you. You know that it works. There's so little to go wrong once the modification has been done successfully. Um, it's not as though you're going to be out there taking uh, tens of pictures of uh, the children or the grandchildren running around the, around the park. You're going to be taking perhaps, um, you know, I don't know, 20 exposures on a clear night. We don't get that many clear nights in the UK anyway. So the camera itself doesn't get an awful lot of use, which is why I would personally make an exception uh, and consider a second-hand modif already modified DSLR camera. And don't worry if it hasn't had a new filter um, fitted to it, um, because you can buy an infrared filter that you can put in the light path somewhere at very reasonable cost. Thank you. Okay. I have a question, uh, uh, Steve. Thanks very much for a fantastic talk. Uh, it's another camera question, I'm uh, afraid to say, but I was really interested by uh, what you were saying about the comparisons between uh, uh, CCD cameras uh, and also CMOS. And traditionally, CCD has always had a bit of the edge in terms of quality, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you think CMOS is catching up and do you see a time where it, when it might sort of uh, actually overtake in terms of quality the uh, the CCD offerings? I think it probably will um, and, and, and I think a lot of it's going to come down to cost. First of all um, CMOS technology is used in far more cameras than CCD cameras. CCD cameras tend to be used for medical and scientific work um, whereas C um, CMOS cameras are used in everything from um, dash cams, webcams, um, digital SLR cameras, and of course now, um, you know, astro cameras. The, um, I think generally people are buying more CMOS cameras now than CCDs. Um, they're very well marketed, they're very well supported. And if you use them correctly, they produce really excellent results, but you have to do a little bit more with them. Whereas with the CCD camera, uh, you essentially connect it up and run it because it's been designed specifically um, for, for that sort of use. The CMOS camera has also been designed specifically for that sort of use, but you have to make some other decisions as well. As well as, uh, for example, your exposure time, uh, you have to consider um, the amount of gain that you want to apply, for example. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, a little bit more complex. Um, the capturing of things like um, bias frames um, has to be uh, considered a little bit more carefully. You can't, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I said that a bias frame is a, a frame taken for the minimum amount of time possible or the minimum amount of exposure possible. Um, that's absolutely true for a CCD camera and was um, generally believed to be the, the, the way to do it with CMOS. But it, it turns out that in fact, um, you really need to take slightly longer exposures uh, for your bias frames, for example, for uh, if you're using a CMOS camera. But um, there is no one size fits all, so you have to experiment to see which one gives you the best result. Once you've got that best result, you can use it every time. Um, so it's not quite as straightforward to get the very, very best results. But having said that, some of the results that are coming out um, from, you know, amateurs uh, like me using CMOS cameras uh, are really very, very encouraging, very, very interesting indeed. Um, and I can see that CCD cameras will probably cease to be manufactured in, um, in the medium term. Um, and it, it, there won't actually be a choice anyway. It'll be, be down to CMOS. Um, but, but the results speak for themselves. There are some stunning images being taken with, um, with, with CMOS cameras. Chinese CMOS cameras, I'm talking about things like ASI, um, for example, um, they're very, very popular. Really beautiful images being captured with, uh, with them, but just a little bit more trial and error to get all the settings right. 
that, that's interesting, and it certainly echoes my experience with the uh, at CMOS that it's almost as if the uh, the extent of the bias is dependent on the exposure length. So to get really good corrections, effectively, I I've been connect, collecting the bias and the darks together and using that as a corrector just on the lights image and having to do the whole process again for yes. the flats image right. uh, in order to get them to all work out. And that seems to be a good equilibrium between yes. the um, between the two, but it really accentuates that at that point that you've brought out. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yes, that's right. And, 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 and I'm, what, what you're doing is, is a good compromise on, on doing it. I mean, you, you could drill down further um, and, and do a whole whole load of, of um of tests on it but the trouble in the uk is we really need to be out imaging rather than messing around all the time yes. and i think that's one of the joys of the ccd camera um you you connect it and, and, and go with it um and it's you know they're they're very very sensitive but you know the cmos cameras are becoming very very sensitive as well um and they have certain advantages as well because you can play about with the gain they're really good for narrowband images because one of the problems with narrowband is because you're um, aiming at a very small amount of, uh, of bandwidth, you don't get anywhere near the photon count. Um, and so you have to take much longer exposures, which is why I, I, my routine hydrogen alpha exposure now is 30 minutes. It's a long old exposure. Um, whereas a CMOS camera, um, you can wind up the gain a bit more and uh, you could capture the same um, amount of uh, uh, of light in a much shorter, well I say a much shorter time, it, it, probably in half the time and that has advantages both for the, um, not only do you get a, more images and the more images you have the better the stacking will become. There is a, a point at which it's, worth, it's, it's not worth taking anymore, it's a diminishing returns thing. Um, but you don't run the risk of losing 30 minutes of exposure because a satellite goes over or an aeroplane goes over. Um, you only lose 15 minutes and so on. So a CMOS, if you like, especially if you're doing narrowband work, um, can be much more productive. So the, 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 there's a strong case for them. Um, I hope that my CCD camera goes on forever. <laughs> but... I would not be averse to getting a, a good quality CMOS camera um, if, if the worst ever happened to mine. Uh, brilliantly informative answer. Thank you very much, Steve. <laughs> um, Steve, Chris here. I've got a couple of very basic level questions being a non-astrophotographer. And each time I've seen stuff about astrophotography, it's kind of put me off and think oh, it's well beyond me. But the way you put it tonight and some of the as you say, for beginners, it's very tempting to think, well, I ought to have a go, actually. There's, you can achieve quite a lot with very little if you go about it in the right way. Mm -hmm. um, but thanks for a great talk. Um, just, as I say, two very basic level que uh, questions or observations. Going right back to the, one of the first images you sh showed, the circumpolar picture of, of, of the pole star and oh, yes. uh, the rotation of the stars around it. Um, you pointed out that the colours came out better. I suppose that's because obviously by definition it's it's a longer exposure, but also because they're streaked, I think the eye, perhaps the, the human eye, captures the colour a little bit more easily in a, in, a, in a strip or a stripe than it does in a point perhaps, even if you had a long exposure of a single point star. Um, do you think that's true? That's why it's a little bit easier. That's, really that's exactly right. Yeah. That's, that, that's exactly the way it works. Very interesting experiment to try if you're doing um, a, an image like that is to, especially if you can motorize it, is to gently change the focus while the image is being taken. Yeah. You wouldn't really want to do it with your hand. It'd be far better if, if you could motorize it. You then end up with a conical image because the stars have trailed. Yeah. They've also gone from the point, which is where you first took the image, to being slightly out of focus. Oh, yes. So the, the light is then spread out. You really see the colours then. So it's a case of seeing, if you like, more of the star. Instead yeah. of looking just at a bright dot, you're looking at it smeared. I see. And but then by changing the focus, you get the, the smear and the smear gets 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 broader. It's broader as yeah, well, so, yes. So it's yeah. a great way of, of looking yeah. at star colour. You get a totally yeah. unrealistic image, of course. Yeah. Um, but, the, but, but it's an enhancement... Um, if you like to, to actually seeing the colour 
um, over just uh, just doing the, um, the star trails. But our, our star trail images are, are, I think, are really beautiful, especially if you can get a nice foreground to them as well. Um, I, think, I think the circumpolar shot is probably the one that anybody with a camera, you go out in the evening, you've got a camera, you put it on bulb, you put it on the tripod, point it roughly north, go away for 20 minutes, um, come back and hopefully you've got something, you know, but it, it, yeah, I think that's probably the first thing I ever tried. Um, just on a, a side note, I, it, it's interesting you showed Polaris as being that very bright, bright blob, but clearly off centre. It was obviously a reasonable magnification. You were homing in on that um, North Pole axis. It's it, You could see quite a few little streaks within that bullseye, as it were. So it's surprising how many stars there are that you could actually more accurately do polar alignment with. But I guess they're so faint that most people just go with Polaris and, you know, that's enough sort of thing as for most people if they're not doing astrophotography. Yeah, that, 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 that's exactly right. One of the, um, the fascinating things about um, long exposures, of course, is um, you pick just up how much more detail comes through. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> when you think what you can see with the eye um, in a blink, so to speak, you, you start taking minutes of exposure and you think just how much extra light you're able to capture. In, in that time yeah you, it's amazing what will then be released but uh, yes you're, you're you're absolutely right uh, and uh, well spotted there are indeed little, little streaks of all sorts of stars in there yeah yeah so. and the other thing was simply i've just realized tonight the difference between guiding and tracking i kind of assumed they were synonymous but if i've understood you correctly what you're saying is that the that if you in in, in a perfect world if you had no wind and if you were using two, two scopes, no flexing, that differential about you were talking about the flexing when you're using two scopes, no wind, no aberrations in terms of atmosphere, no, um, no grit in, I think you mentioned grit in the cogs and that kind of thing. If you had a perfect, perfect tracking system that perfectly followed right ascension based on perfect polar alignment, am I right in thinking you wouldn't need guiding? Absolutely yeah. correct. But so, but the, the point is, there's no such thing as perfect tracking, and the guiding compensates for that. There are some telescopes that get very close to it. Uh -huh. um, for example, uh, a company called Ten Micron. They make a telescope that, that um, many users say they don't have to guide with. And the way that works is that it has um, additional encoders on each axis, and they're very very high resolution encoders. So the mount is set up to run at um, sidereal rate, and uh, as all mount, uh, equatorial mounts are. The DSOs, yeah, yeah. But um, you have an encoder that checks that it really is running at that, and it's a very, very high resolution encoder. So if it no notices the slightest change, it automatically applies a correction. Um, but these are quite expensive mounts, and th th these are mounts that cost, you know, eight, 10,000 pounds, something yeah. like that. But I mean, really, even then, what you're really saying is it's a tracker with a built-in guiding, isn't it? Yes, it is. Effectively. So, yeah. It, 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 it does it by a different process. Yeah. I'm actually not, um, I'm not won over by, by the idea. And the reason I'm not won over is that if you get a, a little bit of wind shear um, or a, a bit of cable drag, et cetera, et cetera, I think that an, an auto guider covers everything mm -hmm. it allows for that little bit of grit in the grease yeah i mean hopefully that's the thing of the part it used to, it used to be a big issue with, with skywatcher mounts at one time i don't think it's such an issue now but it was a, a, a genuine issue there were bits of swarf found uh, found inside uh, some of the, the earlier um, equatorial go-to mounts um and of course they they give you huge out here um diversions from uh, from where they should be Plus, of course, the grease itself, um, it, it, uh, it, it, the grease has got to be firm enough that it doesn't run out, but you don't want it so firm that the, the cogs are having to chomp through it all the time. Yeah. But the very fact that you have a, a layer of grease gives the propensity for it being compressed and squeezed out as it turns, which means that you don't get a perfect mesh and so on. Um, bearings are designed to be beautifully made, but there's um, if, if bearings were perfect, um, we would have a perpetual motion. And I've yet to see ah. a motion that actually works and yeah. so on. So you, you can see that there are, there are all sorts of reasons why it could go wrong. 
An electronic co correction using additional encoders is one way of, way of doing it, but it certainly doesn't cover for um, changes in the atmosphere, for example. I mean, I don't, not, not, quite, not, not necessarily thinking about just seeing, but um, temperature inversions and so on, um, they could have an, have an effect as well. Well, the amount that's tracking perfectly um, before there's a, some kind of temperature inversion won't know about that inversion. It'll continue tracking perfectly, but as far as the telescope's concerned, the star will have moved and so on. So for me, a closed loop um, auto guiding system covers every eventuality and it makes a cheap amount perform really, really well. It won't make a useless mount perform well. No. It might make it work, but that's about all. But you're right, there is a, 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 a definitely a difference. Tracking, that's what they're designed to do. They're designed to track at, uh, at the same rate as the Earth rotates. Um, and they, all, uh, they will do so up to a manufacturing tolerance. After that, and it becomes significant because of the focal lengths uh, and the exposure times that we're, we're talking about, that's when the guiding comes in. And for me, guiding will always win out over um, a, a stupidly expensive mount. Great, thank you. You can't hear you, Mark. Are you talking, Mark? You're not muted, but I can't hear you. Can everyone hear me? I can hear you, but I can't hear Mark though. Are you, Mark, are you? I thought Mark was talking. Now he's muted. I think you might. Or is it your micro microphone boon, Mark? Is it not close enough to your map? No. He's cut off in his prime. <laughs> well, you, you're actually muted at the moment. You're, anyway. you're muted at the moment, Mark. So, yeah. So, no, you're, you're not muted now, but we still can't hear you. That'd be better. That's it. I can hear you. That's it. Yeah. A, a, a thing flashed up on my screen saying your your microphone and speaker is not working because of bandwidth. That's what it said. Well, anyhow, that, would, that would be it then. <laughs> anyhow, <laughs> just to say, Steve, thanks very much yet again for a, a, a brilliant talk on astrophotography. <laughs> and can we can we show our normal appreciation for uh, for the excellent.